My field is primarily the Himalaya. It's where I've spent the last five years with boots on the ground. And I really want to emphasize how important it is to have boots on the ground. We have so much remote sensing capability, but nothing can substitute for actually seeing these things for yourself. Seeing it for yourself takes lots of effort just to get to the front lines of climate change. So we'll be arriving to Kathmandu and we're going to be flying to Lukla. Lukla is around 9,000 feet, one of the world's most dangerous airports. Then onwards from there, we're going to be trekking uphill to a place called Namche Bazaar, which is basically a Sherpa capital. And then onwards to Tagnac. And Tagnac is where we're going to meet all the Sherpa scientists that are going to be participating with us. When I lived abroad for a year, I had a chance to build this initiative called the Sherpa Scientist Initiative to involve the locals in the research, immersed with us in the field. On this trip, we took new trainees, and the hope is to expand this program out in the future. So this trip was to get them excited about the science with lots of cool robotics. This was Uli's fifth expedition to these lakes. But this was the first time she'd taken an open ROV, remotely operated vehicle a citizen science project that builds underwater robots with relatively inexpensive do-it-yourself components. Even in these extreme conditions, Open ROV delivered. Well done, success. Pretty cool. Patrick Rowe has been Uli's science tech since they first met in Antarctica. I flip a switch on the control, mm -hmm. and I have a camera on here that's looking straight forward. Okay. I can see, I can kind of get a view of what I'm heading for. I learned from Patrick see, about the solar technologies, the glacier moving, you know, the underground rocks, I learned from there. Then the USB also, USB, how to remote control. These people are not scientists, but we're teaching them how to think like scientists. We're training them on how to make measurements out in the field, and eventually they take over our project work, take ownership of it, and expand it. Oh, temperature is 4.3 Celsius. That's warm. Our main purpose is looking at climate change in the Himalaya, and we're looking at it along the length of a glacier. So near the terminus in the Himalaya, you have a bunch of these superglacial surface lakes. Uh, that are growing much larger in volume, and they might flood someday. So we're really teaching the Sherpas how to evaluate that through time-lapse photography and with surface and underwater robotics. What we're ultimately creating is three-dimensional maps of what these lake floors look like. So here we are looking at the sonar, the depth, the side scan. Pretty cool, yeah guys? <laughs> and the Sherpas loved piloting autonomous and unmanned vehicles and learning how to do that and spinning them around in circles. We tell them, do you guys want to go and raft on a glacial lake? And that piques their interest. Enlisting the Sherpa means multiplying the sets of eyes and the number of brains that can track what's changing. Right now we're working in a really limited area, a one specific glacier, but there's thousands of glaciers where similar kinds of problems are occurring. So what's learned in this one location, we hope that there's going to be this big ripple effect. While there was time for fun, and even a rubber ducky race that was a fundraiser for the Sherpa Science Initiative, the serious research was focused on how black carbon transported from the Indian subcontinent was impacting these glaciers. When I got there, I was really taken aback by the pollution and how pockmarked the glaciers looked. So instead of this beautiful, pristine ice, you have these big lakes everywhere and there's so much rubble and rocks. Okay, so what this is, this is the name, it's called the handheld two. It measures the wavelengths of light, so we can only see a certain range. This can see beyond, so look at the signal. Put your hand under here. That's what your hand looks like. This is where the win-win of researchers and villagers, scientists plus Sherpa, comes in. Uli and colleagues get year-round measurements. The Sherpa get to understand their changing environment and how best to protect their villages and way of life. And then we're going to make our way across the glacier. Um, well, really interesting to see how that route has changed, how much collapse there's been on the actual glacier, to the village of Gokyo. These lakes are not till two days from now. Tomorrow we go for the day. Gokyo is pretty much the last stop to Tibet. And so it's a small little village that has maybe 100 people at its height. And the sounds that you hear is clink, clink, clink when they're building up new tea houses or they're herding the yaks, so you hear the yak cowbells. There's never silence 
because not only do you have the sounds of the village life, but of the glacier, of things gurgling and cracking and breaking apart. What we didn't know until a couple of years ago was there's a, there's a glacier above that lake that had the potential of bursting out. And so if these outburst floods happen, it's taking out villages below. And you have thousands of people's lives at risk. Then from Gokyo, we kind of go off the grid. We're going to go further to what's called Sixth Lake near the border with Tibet. And then we're going to climb a glacier. And here is the view of this awesome, awesome glacier surrounded by amazing mountains. Close to about 18,000 feet here. Sorry if I'm a little bit shaky. I'm really tired. And then Choyo, you up there under the clouds. Pretty incredible place. Although a snowstorm trapped them inside their tents for a whole day, they stuck it out and got their samples. We're looking for black carbon, dust, and other contaminants that are falling onto the snowpack and the ice and melting it a lot faster. I'm not really out of breath because we're almost at 18,000 feet. It's been hard work. The black carbon is really to understand the impacts of it on melting. With sooty snow collected, they began their descent. You can see all the water spilling off the glacier and some of the lakes. This is gonna get much faster. Flowing when the monsoon starts. Back at base, it was time to review the sampling procedures with Sonam Sherpa. And the filters will tell us basically the concentrations of the black carbon and we'll be able to predict how much melting that should cause. You can already see how dirty this filter is. See how brown? That's good. But you feel this pressure? Yeah. Yeah. We want to teach not just how to collect the data, but what does it mean? And with our citizen science initiative, that's what we're doing. So I'm teaching and training. And then I have a head Sherpa then who will teach the next generation coming through and then to the next village over. We want to see this ripple effect with this initiative. In Kathmandu, Uli shared the Sherpa Science Initiative's latest findings on how the lakes and glaciers are changing. So all the information that we're collecting gets disseminated to the national park as well as the locals that are in line for the flooding or who are using the water source. Back in Boulder, I spoke with Uli on how the research would benefit the Sherpa. So I understand the meltwater and the calving is bad for the glacier health. What does it mean for the people? Twofold. One is these lakes are getting bigger and deeper and you have the moraine that's melting down with all the ice inside and then you have the water level rising. So you have this, this, this threat of flooding. And also how do we immerse these people who have it right in their backyards. It's, it's their land, you know, and, and just really teaching them ownership of, of the data ultimately too.